Good evening. As Pastor Dave said, we will be in 2 Timothy um, chapter 4 today, so if you want to go ahead and turn there. As we are turning there, though, um, it's important for us to always remind ourselves of the context of the passage that we are studying. So 2 Timothy was um, a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy while he was in prison, um, and this was actually leading up right to his execution. So this was going to be his last letter that he wrote to his uh, dear brother Timothy. Um, And that's important because we see in here that this is kind of Paul's final charge um, to Timothy, who had kind of been his spiritual son um, throughout the years. And then um, he had been sent off on his own journey right now. And so this was Paul writing for that final charge and also eventually kind of asking if Timothy could come back to see him just one last time. Um, So... We're going to be reading uh, verses 1 through 8, then we're going to pray, and then we'll get into the word. 2 Timothy 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, But have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Let us pray. Father, uh, we come to you tonight, Lord, um, just thankful, Lord, thankful for the, all that you've done for us. Thank you for bringing us here this evening. Thank you for allowing us to come and worship you freely, Lord. Um, thank you for the gift of your word that we are able to open it up and study it, Father. Thank you for the gift of your church, that we're able to come together with like-minded believers to push each other closer to you, Father. Lord, most of all, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy, Father, that you would use such wretched sinners like us, Father, to proclaim your gospel. Lord, I pray this evening that um, I would hide behind your cross, that it would be your words spoken through me, Father, and not my own, that it would be your words falling on open hearts here, Lord, um, and that you would just bless our time together this evening. So, Lord, once again, we just thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so for anybody that knows me, you would know that I'm a big sports fan. I can sit down and watch just about any sport out there. But one of my favorite things about watching sports is hearing the stories of men and women that kind of come in at an unexpected time and perform the task like they've been doing it for years. Um, and now, admittedly, I'm not a big hockey fan. Never been able to get into hockey. Um, don't really get the rules, and just doesn't interest me a whole lot. But I can still sit down and watch it occasionally. Uh, but there's one rule about hockey that I've always found fascinating, and that is something called the emergency goalie. I don't know if anybody's heard the story from about a week ago, but an emergency goalie in hockey is somebody that just comes to the arena of the game, is not a hockey player in any way. I mean, they may play like on the side, but in no way professional. Um, and they sit there. And the only way they see any action is if both goalies on one team get hurt. And this is like a crazy rule to me because they could literally play for either team. They're not assigned a team. It's literally just whoever has two goalies go out, they come in. So most guys do this, and they can do it for years and never see any type of game action because, I mean, how often do two goalies get hurt in the same game? But just last Saturday, there was one. His name was David Ayers. Um, He's the emergency goalie for the games at the... Uh, Toronto Maple Leafs Arena, and they were playing the Carolina Hurricanes, and the Hurricanes had two goalies that went out with injuries in just the second period, so this wasn't like he just got in for like a minute of action, no, he played a period and a half of professional hockey, Um, this would be like somebody coming off out of the stands to play for Tom Brady or um, any other NFL or NBA player out there that we would just think they wouldn't stand a chance, well he comes out and the first two shots that were shot against him, he allowed his goals. But after that, (laughs) here comes the redemption part of it. (laughs) After that, um, 
he blocked the next eight straight shots and led them to a 6-3 to three victory. Um, first of all, that's just like insane to me. But second of all, he was ready whenever he was called to duty, called to action in the game. And that's what Paul is encouraging Timothy with here. He needs to be ready in every season. Um, so that's going to lead us into our three points for tonight. One is the charge. Two, the reason for the charge. And three, the reward for the charge. The charge we're going to see in verses 1, 2, and 5. Um, so we're going to read those, and we'll come back to 3 and 4 a little bit later. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Skipping down to 5. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. All right, <clears throat> so when we look back at uh, verse 1 here, we see immediately that he charges him in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, okay? First of all, that's important because this is not just Paul saying this, but this is in the presence of God. But it's that detail after that I really want us to focus on, who is to judge the living and the dead. That's something that if we could very easily just read past, but it's not a detail that's thrown in there for no reason. This is reminding Timothy the urgency and the importance of preaching the word, that God is going to judge all of us. And we're going to look at this in two ways. One is that God is going to judge everyone around us. I mean, everyone that's ever lived on this earth. And when we think about it that way, our hearts should grieve for the people we know that are not believers. And I don't mean just like the typical, like, I wish that, we, I wish that God would accept Christ. But we should really grieve for these people. These are people that are going to spend eternity separated from Christ if they do not get to know him. And I think too often we just kind of treat it as um, kind of just like something we think about but not, don't really care too much about. I know that in my own personal experience, sometimes I can be more grieved over a bad day at work than my coworker that's lost. Or uh, for people in school, sometimes they can grieve more over just a bad grade in a class than possibly their classmates that's lost. Um, I would even go as extreme to say that there are times, and this is speaking to myself here, where we may even feel more grief over our favorite sports team losing a game than the lost person next to us. That should not be the way this is. We should really recognize just how important sharing the gospel is, how important um, caring for the non-believers in our life is. Um, and that's what we see uh, Paul encouraging Timothy with here. But there's one more part to that, too, that's important, that we will also be judged. Now, by no means am I saying that we are saved by our works. We are 100% saved by grace through faith. But God is still going to judge each and every one of us. So if the reason we're not sharing the gospel is that we're afraid of making someone uncomfortable or we're afraid of what someone may think of us or possibly a broken relationship, what's more important, pleasing the God of the universe that has loved us and sent his son for us that will judge us or maybe making somebody a little more comfortable or maybe maintaining a relationship these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves because, and I'm speaking to myself as well, because so often we can make excuses for not sharing with someone because of reasons that are not valid, um, that we just kind of make as a way to make ourselves feel better. And then he continues on and he says, preach the word. Okay, so this is when we see that's kind of setting the stage for the charge, and then this is where the actual charge begins. Preach the word. Not our own thoughts, not what we have and what we think and what we do, while those should be based in the word, they are still based in the word. If we ever try to base it on our own um, merits or our own thoughts, then we are going to be completely insufficient. We are nothing apart from Christ. We cannot do anything on our own um, to further his kingdom. It is all his work, his will, his mercy, his grace. And then to be ready in season and out of season. This is kind of going back to that sports um, metaphor there. All sports pretty much have a off season and then a season where they play. So the off season, the athletes, they're still working out and all, but they typically would not be able to just go in and play a game during the off season because they're not in their game shape. Well, Paul is telling us here that we don't have an off season. We must always be prepared. We must always be ready to defend Christ, to proclaim his name. But I know for me, I become relaxed. I, I've kind of take that off season sometimes. I allow for 
that laziness or maybe some priorities um, to being out of order to come in and take hold in my life. And I would imagine I'm not the only one that does that at times. Again, these are questions we need to be asking ourselves to realize if we are truly um, following this charge that Paul set forth to Timothy. And yes, this charge is to Timothy, who is a uh, pastor, so um, it's, a, it's a little bit different. He's pastoring a church, but I don't see anything in here that we should not all be following. Um, it doesn't, it, pastors are not the only ones that are called to go and preach the word and teach the word. Yes, they may be the only ones that are preaching it over a large group of people sometimes, but we can preach the word to our neighbor or to our coworker, to our kids, um, friends, significant others, whatever it may be. Uh, so we need to be ready at all times. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, and then reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Okay, so these are all th three things, reprove, rebu rebuke, and exhort, where we're kind of pushing someone towards something, either calling them out in something. When I say that, I don't mean in a negative way. I mean that in a loving way. Um, but then also, uh, you could just be pushing them towards something in their life that you uh, could see the Lord calling them to, or maybe um, what Scripture is telling them. But I want us to really focus in on the part where it says, with complete patience and teaching. And this also brings to mind Second Peter, or First Peter 3.15, where it says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So we are seeing these same concepts here. Again, always being prepared to make a defense. Do it with gentleness and respect. So it's bringing that always being prepared but then the gentleness and respect with patience and teaching. We can't expect to be able to tell somebody something one time and they just automatically get it. And if we begin to expect that, then I would say for us to examine our own hearts and see, do, do we really function that way? Do we really just get something immediately? Did we get the gospel the first time that somebody preached to us? Maybe we did. The Lord can work, obviously. But we can't get discouraged if someone doesn't. This means this could be a long-term thing. You could have somebody that you shared the gospel with for 25 years, and they just showed no response to it. But in that 26th year, it may be that all of a sudden something clicks, and all of those seeds that you've been planting are all of a sudden watered, and they grow. Just like you could have somebody, and I think this is more of what Paul is talking to Timothy about here as well, that is a believer. And it can be a discipling relationship. I mean, Long-term discipling relationships, Paul and Timothy right here. I mean, people, scholars believe that they had a relationship for at least 20 years. Um, so it's important that we don't get discouraged because we may not see immediate results in something. Discipling relationships take time. They take patience. They take teaching. We must teach and not just expect that they are going to understand something because we read, it, we read the same passage. Again, these are important questions to be asking ourselves if we are treating our discipling relationships and our gospel conversations this way. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a little bit of a cough. All right, if we scoot on down to verse 5, it says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Oh, wait, sorry, wrong verse. Verse 5, as for you, always be sober-minded, and dear suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. All right. Now, this is a comment not meant to be controversial in any way, but I guess it could be. Uh, but I think it's important to address because of what the scripture is saying here. And that is verse 5. It starts with saying, be sober-minded. Now, I want to preface with what I'm about to say, that we're going to take this a little off track here for a second. What I'm about to say is not saying that I think drinking of age without getting drunk is a sin. I don't think there's anything in Scripture that points to that. But what I will say, and Pastor Dave hit on this a few weeks ago kind of as well, is I don't think that it's wise for us as believers to. And that's because, one, we see here to be sober-minded. Even if we're not, say you don't drink to get drunk, how do we know where that exact line is when we go from being sober-minded to a non-sober mind? But on top of that, if we are preaching the word to people, and they see this passage, and they walk in somewhere and see us drinking alcohol, even if you're not getting drunk in any way, their perception could very well be that you are. And in that case, their perception is their reality. And do we really want to possibly diminish what we've been teaching them 
over a simple drink. Now, that's not to say that if you drink an occasional uh, beer or whatever, maybe I'm not saying you're a bad Christian by any means, okay? I want to make that very clear. I'm not saying it's a sin. I just think it's something that we should consider. And I would plead with you to really um, think about if abstaining from alcohol may would be a wise move um, that would be a way that we can kind of die to ourselves for the kingdom. As Pastor Dave said, too, a few weeks ago, he's never met somebody, and I hadn't either, that has regretted not drinking. But there are many people out there that have regretted taking a first drink or drinking at all. Um, Again, something to think about. We're going to get back into this. I just felt like with that being in the passage, it needed to be talked about. Uh, But then he goes into enduring suffering. And what Paul is not saying here is there may be suffering or there's the potential you could face some hardships. No, he is saying that there's going to be suffering and endure it. I mean, look at Paul's life right now. He is literally about to be executed for the gospel. There is going to be suffering. And we should rejoice in that. Now, we're very thankful and blessed in this, where we live in this country that we don't typically face the um, suffering that many people in this world do for the gospel. We are very fortunate in that. But in the times where we do face suffering, whether it's um, dealing with possibly losing a job or um, maybe not getting a, a promotion or just strained relationships, whatever it may be, we should rejoice in that. Because the scripture tells us all throughout that we will suffer for Christ. Jesus himself said to his disciples that people would hate them because of his name. So when we are facing any type of suffering, what we're seeing is a fulfillment of scripture. We're seeing God's word being made true again and again. So we should be thankful and praise the Lord for that, no matter how challenging it may be. And then we see um, for him to do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Okay, this is kind of um, bringing the end to the charge and just kind of summing it all up in once to do the work of an evangelist, to go back to preaching that word, to teaching people to have patience with them, and to fulfill your ministry. Okay, and this leads us to the reason for the charge. That's going to take us back to verses 3 and 4. I'm going to read those again for us real quick. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth, truth and wander off into myths. All right, so when we look at this passage, I think we should look at it in two ways. One, the people around us, and then two, our own hearts. So we're going to look at the people around us first. One, we can look at people that are non-believers, okay? I think Paul is addressing more here of believers that may be falling into some uh, different teachings. We're going to look at non-believers real quick with this because I believe that it applies to that as well. We see where non-believers a lot of times they're not interested um, in Christ because it does require a change. We can't live the way that we would as non-believers once we become believers. We should not, at least. Now, obviously, we're not perfect, but that we should not be content living in that sin. But looking at it more from the perspective of believers and them uh, possibly not enduring that sound teaching. When we look at that with today's, um, with the lens of today on it, We see this in a few ways in the church. One, and this is a pretty obvious one I feel like, is the prosperity gospel. People go into that because it teaches that they will be rich, they can have perfect health, whatever it may be. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I feel like we've all heard a good bit about it, but it's important to realize that that is a completely false gospel. Again, we see suffering all throughout scripture. If we were called to have perfect health and to be completely rich, then I'm pretty sure Paul, one of the most influential missionaries of all time, would not have been put in prison and executed. That, that, it doesn't add up when we really examine it with the scriptures. But the one that I see, and it kind of plays into this as well, the one that I'm seeing more um, today is us caring more about happiness than holiness. And that's something we see in churches throughout our country. Um, churches throughout the world. We see it in, sometimes in our own hearts, um, sometimes in the hearts of those around us. But it is a sneaky 
sneaky way of coming in and pulling us away from the Lord. Because we can be tricked into thinking that we are all learning about the Lord, we're um, growing closer to him, but are we really when we examine it? We see a lot of churches now, and when I say a lot, I don't mean all churches or even the majority of churches. I'm just talking about that you see it a few different ways of people coming in and the church's main goal being to have them come in, get real excited and pumped up, and just send them out. And if you look at what the core of it actually is, it's, it's very little teaching and worrying about their holiness. It's a lot of just feel-good stuff that makes us excited, but is it really growing us? Now, thankfully, I think the elders at our church do a really good job of um, teaching the word and not worrying about us being happy, but worrying about our holiness. Now, a lot of times we can, st- I mean, I would say most of the time we still leave church very happy and excited about what God has done for us because we have the joy that is found in Christ. If we are building something only on happiness, it's not going to last. Um, I was talking to Ben Oliver one time. It's been a few years ago. Um, And he said something to me that just stuck with me. I was talking to him about, I just wasn't, I felt like I was kind of in a rut, not really feeling as close to the Lord in that moment. And he was just like, if my salvation was dependent on my feelings, I wouldn't be saved. Because our feelings are going to go away. Our feelings will change. What will not change is the joy and contentment that can be found in Christ. And that leads us into looking at ourselves as well. When we are looking for advice on something, when we are looking for um, just somebody to tell us where they think the Lord is pointing us, do we go to somebody that we know is going to turn to the word, or do we go to someone who may just tell us what we want to hear, that's going to tell us what makes us happy? Or when we're confessing sin, are we going to go confess it to someone that is <clears throat> going to hold us accountable for it, or someone that's going to just give the old, well, thanks for telling me, I'll be praying for you, and that's the last time it's mentioned. Yes, it's good to confess sin, but we need to be confessing sin to people that are going to hold us accountable to them. Going back to just worrying about our own happiness, we see in Philippians 4 that happiness isn't going to be what contains us or going to be what um, anchors us down. Philippians 4, 10 through 12, it says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Paul himself is saying right there that he has been brought low. That it's not like he's just always on top of the world. But he is anchored in that contentment that we can have in Christ. And the never-ending and never-failing hope and love of Christ. And that leads us to our third point, the reward for the charge. See, Timothy, or Paul follows this up to Timothy with what I would say are three of the most encouraging verses in Scripture. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So verse 6 is where Paul is informing Timothy um, that his time is coming to an end, that he is already being poured out as a drink offering, using that Old Testament imagery there, that he's being poured out as a drink offering. And you see here that it's not um, him saying that this is his own doing, this is God's will, that he is being poured out. Okay, It's not like he is just choosing to, but he is being poured out. And the time of his departure has come. But then verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. I know um, many of you have probably heard this story before, but there was an Olympic runner one time called Derek Redmond, and he had been training for the Olympics his whole life, um, and he had just had a career that was plagued by injuries. But we got to the semifinals of the, uh, at the Olympics in 1992, and he was running the 400 meter, and just before he had crossed the halfway point, he tore his hamstring, and he tried to hobble his way to the end, but he couldn't. He fell. 
Well, his father jumped the barrier, made it through security, and helped him finish that race. He helped him get along, and he finished those 400 meters. Well, that is just like Paul is here, except for so much greater. This is not because of Paul's own doing. Yes, he has fought the good fight. He has finished the race. He has kept the faith, but not because of him. It's because of the grace of God. Paul, on his own, was murdering Christians. But then the grace of God came in, and he, he fought the good fight. He finished the race. We cannot do it on our own. We are only here because of the grace of God and the love of him. I was listening to um, the song, All I Have is Christ, earlier. And I'll probably end up botching the lyric here. But um, there was a lyric in it where it says, If you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. And that is the epitome of the gospel. That God created the perfect earth and then created Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were tempted into sin. They brought sin into the world, separating us from God. Then all throughout the Old Testament, we see people having to um, do ritualistic things, make sacrifices in order to uh, be forgiven for their sins, to showing their faith in the Lord. But then God came down in the flesh, fully and truly man, fully and truly God, living a perfect life, and then giving his life on the cross, taking on the punishment for our sins, becoming sin who knew no sin, and dying. And then three days later, praise the Lord, raising from the dead, defeating the punishment for sin, defeating death, and opening up the door to a relationship with him to where we can spend eternity with him. And all we have to do is to turn from our sin and turn to him and put our faith in him. We see Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace I have been saved through faith. Okay, That is how we are saved, is by grace. Once we are saved, um, then we have where it comes into verse 8, where we see the reward there for us. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. That when our time on this earth is done, if we are in Christ, we will be glorified with him, and we will spend eternity with him and with our brothers and sisters. So, if you are here tonight and you are not a believer in this, I would just plead with you to really consider what Christ has done for us. To really think about if tonight is when you could start your race. By God's grace that he would bring you to him. And if you are here and you are a believer, well, I would just pray and plead with you that we would live our life for Christ in a way that when our time on this earth is done, the people around us would be able to say they fought the good fight. They finished the race. And I missed my word here. <laughs> and they have kept the faith. Let us pray. Lord, we are so thankful, Father, for all that you've done for us. Lord, I just pray for each person in here, Father, that uh, you would just draw them close to you, Lord. That we would fight the good fight. We would be running the race, and we would keep the faith, Father. I pray that everyone in here, Lord, as they go through this week, would preach the word. Would follow the commands that you have given us in Scripture, Father. And Lord, most of all, we are just so thankful for salvation, Lord. That you have loved such wretched sinners like us and used such wretched people like us to then proclaim your gospel, Father. Lord, we are so undeserving of your love and your mercy. We are deserving of your wrath. But you have loved us and you have given us that grace and mercy, Father. And for that, we are so thankful. And Father, I just pray that we would live our lives like we are, Lord that we would strive for you. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray.